Hey, I'm Riley Ross. I recently went down to the Oklahoma State Capitol to visit with Representative Mickey Dollins. He is the state representative from uh, Oklahoma House District 93, which is on the south side of Oklahoma City, uh, just a little bit north of where I grew up, and really just a, a district, well, really a geographic location where I spent just a ton of uh, my childhood eating in some of the best Mexican and barbecue restaurants in Oklahoma City. Representative Dollins has an interesting story that I think is uh, very appealing to a lot of Oklahomans, and he's been able to accomplish quite a bit at a particularly young age. And uh, I think there's a certain amount of skepticism that comes with such high achievement at such a young age. But one thing that really shines through when talking with Representative Dollins is how much he has uh, worked for the things that he's achieved. And usually when I speak to younger kids, I go into a bit more depth in that and how, how to recognize opportunities, how to maybe create your own, especially when it seems like the cards are stacked against you. Yeah. And in and, and the neighborhoods I live in and I visit, that seems to be the case a lot. And so that's always been a part of my legislation too. And that's one uh, avenue where Apprenticeship Oklahoma came through was creating more opportunities, helping kids create their own opportunities. And as anyone who's trying to create a public platform in any way, be it podcasting or public speaking or being a politician or growing a business or entrepreneurship, uh, knows is that social, the social media game is particularly hard. And one thing that stands out about Representative Dollins is it seems like his social media game is on point. I don't know if there's a question associated with that. It's just more of an admiration thing. Well, thanks. So welcome to Y'all OK. Howdy, friends and neighbors. Welcome to Y'all OK, a podcast about the state of Oklahoma and the people connected to it. Uh, I am Riley Ross. This is um, this was a fun episode for me. This is the first time I've actually been inside the Oklahoma State Capitol, as far as I know. There's a lot of construction going on in there, and it was a little bit uh, um, confusing to navigate in. However, it was a cool experience, and... Um, and Representative Dollins was very nice. The artwork that we talk about that his uh, former students from U.S. Grant made for him, I put that up on the Y'all OK Facebook page, so check that out. Uh, I found him to be a, a warm, cool, uh, down-to-earth guy, which is, I think, something that you hope for uh, talking to talking to people younger than yourself. And I haven't edited edited this much. Uh, I'm trying something different. So uh, in addition to the ongoing efforts to refine this show and, and add value to you, the listener, I am also going to only minimally edit the actual interview portion. And if that means that weird pauses and my uhs and ands are left in there, um, so be it. It just means that I have to conduct a better interview without the uhs and ands. So it's an effort to sort of make me better uh, as an interviewer and as a presenter. So I think he's, uh, I think Representative Dollins has a compelling story and I hope you enjoy it. This episode is sponsored by Al's Bicycles Northwest at 7930 North MacArthur Boulevard, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. That's just a block north of Northwest Expressway on MacArthur. Phone number is 405 728 Give them a call and get set up with the bicycle that's going to fit your needs. No matter where you are in the city or state, they can hook you up. So 405-728-7100. As always, thanks, Al's Bicycles, for your support. So without any further messing around, please enjoy this interview with Representative Mickey Dollins. Thank you for thank you for being on, y'all. Okay, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming up to the Capitol. It was nice of you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. It actually felt kind of uh, special. 
I don't mind meeting at coffee shops and stuff like that, but yeah. Yeah, for listeners at home, we're actually in the Capitol's vault right now. Being a freshman Democrat, they put me in here. You have to watch your head when you walk in because the uh, rafters are kind of low, but it's nice. It's uh, very humbling. People feel <laughs> not quite as intimidated in here. I remember hearing a story on NPR. I think it was like... I don't know, two years ago or something like that, maybe maybe three years ago, but they were talking to freshman senators and freshman representatives in D.C. and uh, describing that the offices that they live or that they have to work in and or the offices that they have. So, yeah, or, or live in. Yeah, exactly. So I, for, based off of what I've heard, it's not that different. Maybe even a little bit better here. I'm not really sure. I was just talking to President Boren the other day at OU, and I found out that this used to be his office as well. Oh, really? Uh, I think he was a few years into his uh, being a legislator, and his entire caucus got upset with him for something, and they put him in here. No way. And that was one of the reasons why he ran for governor at such a young age. He's 33. Yeah. So he decided, well... I'm not well liked here. I don't know what he did to upset him, but uh, uh, it worked out for him in the end. Yeah, I think so. Ah, sure. I'd say so. The so his campaign manager on that gubernatorial campaign, a fellow by the name of Bob Burke, mm-hmm. um, trying to get him on the show right now. So Bob, I'm coming after you. That'd be a good one. Yeah, I think so. He's written like about two million books, <laughs> <laughs> mostly on Oklahoma. Yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to see how the campaigns have changed from back then oh, until man. now. You know, Warren had his Warren Broom Brigade. Yeah, and they were reforming and sweeping out the old and bringing in the new. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to see. Yeah, very much like a what was that George Clooney movie where they actually employed that. Well, he was in a the it's Coen Brothers movie. Oh, brother, where art thou? Yeah, they actually had that shtick in there. Uh-huh. Uh huh. They the did, reformer. didn't they? Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. I'm a Dapper Dan man. Exactly. I don't want fuck. <laughs> Dang it. I'm a Dapper Dan man. You look like you could actually use you use I need Dapper a little Dapper Dan, Dan don't I? Well, I'm a little scruffy. Uh, that's something different for me. Uh, <laughs> I've got bald issues. Uh, I was just admiring your artwork uh, that we're talking about off mic. Uh, so it's a it's a black, white, and gray piece. It's it's not necessarily monochromatic. I don't know what. So your students at US Grant made this for you. So my question is, are you, were you an art teacher? No, but shortly after I was elected, I was told that they had something for me. And so I went, I went to U.S. Grant High School, and I found out that about eight of my students collaborated to make this, uh, to make this painting behind me here. And it, it's the Oklahoma Peace Shield. You've got the pipe on there. and It's really, really modern looking. It's very yeah. interesting. It always catches people's eye. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's fantastic. I'm gonna take a picture of it and put it on. Uh, I'll put it on the site. There's a good story behind this one too. Well, I again, used to work on the drilling rigs in Oklahoma. Right. And a friend of mine, who was traveling across the country, stayed a couple nights in Oklahoma. Yeah. And uh, crashed on my couch. And when I came home, I uh, I came home to this as a present of. For, for saying thank you for letting me stay here. So the interesting That's thing awesome. about it, it's a really old uh, drilling rig. Yeah. And it kind of has this there will be blood feel to it. Very much so, yeah. Very, a lot of red and orange. In and it, yeah. the, entire, the entire painting is made with oil-based paints. So there you go. Good. And yeah, then, no, and then that's we, fantastic. Over here to my left, we've got some embroidery here that my uh, legislative assistant made for me on her sewing machine. Whoa. Yeah. So there's perks. There's perks to being a legislator. Got a lot of nice people here. That's fantastic. Oh, man, this is this is a ton of good stuff. And then, of course, you got your SMU uh, team photo from the Hawaii Bowl. Yeah. That, okay, so back in the day, SMU used to be a powerhouse because they used to pay their players. And, sure. And they used to have a saying that when you went from SMU to the NFL, you took a pay cut. Yeah. And eventually the NCAA caught on, and they shut the program down for two years. And it had been 25 years since they had been back to a bowl game. And June Jones came in from Hawaii, and funny mm-hmm. enough, our first bowl game was back in Hawaii, and we played Colin Kaepernick, and uh, against we played when he was playing for Nevada, yeah, and we ended up beating them forty-five to ten. And um, did you get that, any? Did you get any tackles on? Yeah, Cap? so I I got I sacked Cap. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it was a, a great week. Uh, they let us stay there a week before we actually play the game. Right. And so we were surfing and doing all the fun things, hiking, went to yeah. Pearl Harbor. It was a once-in-a-lifetime experience for many of us. Oh, that's very cool, man. 
And, of course, it's just a bowl game. I mean, if you're going to have a bowl game in D1, it might I know, as well right? be in Hawaii. Yeah, and that I was act- on Christmas Eve. So. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. I actually tried to uh, get on at the University of Hawaii, and I was told, like, well, you can walk on. but And I was like, uh, I don't want what to. What position did you play? Guess. I'd say I don't want to say punter, but I would. Right. That's fine. I'm cool no, with that. No, 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 no. I, I will say, mm, you know, it's so funny because our bodies change so much after I athletics. Know. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say maybe a D lineman. Well, yeah, close. Center. Center. O yeah. lineman. Yeah. Okay. You seem way too nice to be an O lineman. Well, I wasn't good. <laughs> Wasn't good. O linemen are some of the meanest people I've ever met. They are like uh, nasty. I, I went to sorry. I graduated from Westmore in two thousand one. Yeah, which is just south of your district. Uh, and uh, like when I so when I was a sophomore in high school, I weighed about two sixty. By the time I graduated, I was about two fifteen. And so I went to Northwestern and Alva. Mm-hmm. And they had a cool program there that was based on the option. And so I was like, yeah, we need you to run. We need you to be fast and stuff like that. And I was like, well, that's great because I'm not that huge. And both of the centers ahead of me were also, the starter was like 230, but he was just like, as you say, just mean. Mm -hmm. He was Mm -hmm. mean and he was a dog. And the guy that was second string was also, they were like real scrappy. And then so by the end of the year, they were like, "Uh, yeah, um, they had me play in tight end a little bit, so I was doing tight end and center, and they still told me that they wanted me to be about 250 pounds. And I thought, well, I mean, I think you just got to know when, you know, you got to know when it's your time. Mm-hmm. And I I think it was my time. You were anchoring that O-line as center. You know, that kind of reminds me of when we would play in the um, Navy in Annapolis. Uh-huh. Those O linemen were all, I mean, none of them were over 6'1. Right. N- none of them were really over 240 pounds, but they were the toughest team we've ever played. Yeah. And especially in Annapolis and that just historic football stadium with all the soldiers there. Yeah. Their mentality was beyond anything we had ever faced. Yeah. They, every play, they just wanted two yards, you know, and they right. would just take you out at the knees mm-hmm. and keep driving and then fourth down every time they'd go for it. I think I played them three years and they probably threw on us twice. Really? You know, and, as, yeah. and as a D lineman, that wears you out after a while. So it's like, yeah, you might win the game. And we never did. <laughs> but but we're, you're going to feel it the next day. Yeah. That's crazy. So um, where'd you grow up? I'm originally from Bartlesville. And I okay. earned a football scholarship to SMU. Okay. Went down there and majored in English. Okay, cool. Uh, decided to try out for the NFL. Ended up uh, coming up a bit short. And uh, the head coach from the Olympic bobsledding team uh, called me up and said, Hey, we noticed your scores. You know, I'm sorry I didn't get drafted to the NFL, but we're having a combine at the Michael Johnson Performance Center in Irving. Okay, yeah. I was and so say. I went down there and I ran and lifted and jumped and did all this stuff and I performed well enough to get invited to Lake Placid, New York at the Olympic Training Center. Okay. We pretty much did the same thing up there and then one of the drivers asked me to be on his four-man team and I was the second pusher on that. I set second okay. in the four-man bobsled. Okay. Very cool because I was, I was going to ask about that. Like what is the positioning? Where do they want guys to line up? Because <laughs> when you graduated... I'm guessing you were about 260 or so. I was. I was about 260, and I dropped about a good um, 50 pounds in three months. Like intentionally? Yeah, because I had to be able to sit inside the bobsled. Yeah. I actually, when I um, grad, whenever I finished my last game, we actually played in the Army Bowl uh, um, against Army. I guess it was the Armed Forces Bowl against Army. Um, I decided that I wanted to drop my D line weight, Mm -hmm. and it's kind of motivation. I. uh, Decided to go out for a linebacker in the NFL. Had never played linebacker, but it was good sure. motivation. How hard can it be? Uh, yeah, and so I trained and trained, and then it just, you know, that opportunity uh, led to the bobsledding team. And That's I awesome. just took it from there. And thankfully, I had a, uh, a, a guy in, in Oklahoma City who had, this is a funny story. Um, I had got, I was offered my first job as a sophomore in, uh, at SMU. I actually missed the team flight to Birmingham, Alabama. And I got a phone call from my coach when they were all at the airport, and they wow. realized I wasn't with them. I misread my itinerary. Oh, my god! So gosh. luckily I had a little bit of money saved up, and I bought my own ticket to okay. Birmingham. And I got on the flight, and I ended up sitting next to this guy 
who's from Oklahoma, played football at SMU, and he owned an oil company. Oh, snap. I didn't know that till later, but we hit it off, and he offered to give me a ride to the hotel. And you know, I I was knew I was going to be in huge trouble with my coaches for missing the flight. That's in you know in college, that's the yeah. number one thing is trust. And I, I show up with with this guy, and I find out that he's the uh, school's number one athletic donor oh my and gosh. so i got off the hook and then he said keep in touch when when you graduate i'd like to offer you a job with my oil company wow and the plan was was to spend three months in the field and then be the procurement manager mm -hmm. here in oklahoma city well when i had the opportunity to go compete on the united states bobsledding team he said go for it we'll always have a job for you here so about three years later, I came back to Oklahoma City, and he said, we still have a job for you, but oil's taking a dip, so we're, we're going to keep you in the field. Yeah. And so that's how I was a roughneck for the entirety of my oil field career wow. or my, my oil company career. I was uh, out there for about a year and a half. Wow. That's nuts, man. <laughs> so a um, couple of questions then. What made you, being from Bartlesville, shout out to Frank Lloyd Wright, and his giant building there. Um, what made you, when you decided to move back to Oklahoma City in pursuit of this oil field job, like, did you, did you want to be in Oklahoma City specifically? Or, I mean, a lot of people that grow up on the eastern part of the state want to stay on the eastern part of the state. Yeah. And a lot of people that grow up on the west, like, I, I'm from Oklahoma and I lived in Broken Arrow for a bit, but I wanted to get back to Oklahoma City. Isn't that funny? You kind of have a turf battle between Tulsa and Oklahoma City. A little City. bit, yeah. And I don't like it, but it's, I've a, it's I've, there. All my family lives in northeast Oklahoma. Uh, I just had the opportunity to pursue that job. And I lived in Norman. And mm -hmm. I worked in... I worked all over the state uh, on the f on, on the rigs, but mostly I was in Davis, Oklahoma, and um, gosh, a little town outside of Norman. Uh, the name eludes me right now. Um, I'll think of it later. But yeah, there's a and bunch. And we were in Alva and just pretty okay. much all over. But then when the bust came, they they laid the rigs over, mm -hmm. and I went to uh, this rig I was working on. This is a mom pop oil operation so all vertical wells right okay. the rigs we worked on were made in the 1970s we did right. everything by hand through chains i mean very dangerous stuff right yeah and so whenever that one went down they started laying their rigs over it just wasn't profitable i went to work for a much more modern company with state-of-the-art drilling rigs and i get on that floor and i realized that a lot of the jobs that we used to do by hand had been replaced with automation right and it didn't require nearly as many hands to yeah. to complete a well and that was one of my first I didn't even know it at the time but that was the first experience I had with just job displacement due to automation okay and you're starting to see that more and more now yeah. and that is a big influencer in what inspired me to create apprenticeship Oklahoma okay which reskills adults and then helps uh, young people find uh, work in the trades right on so is that um when that applies to, so you say it applies to adults, like, is that, so for adults that are wanting to get, they've left one particular career and they're trying to do something, and, and what is it, um, what it, does it apply to? So does it, like, apply to coding and STEM jobs, or is it uh, specifically with trades like plumbers and oil folks? That's and a great question, and it's, in fact, both. Uh, your traditional apprenticeships, like in the building trades, we have absolutely a lot of need for that. I mean, mm -hmm. you're, I just read an article today that said we probably don't have enough construction workers in the United States to rebuild Houston right now. The average age of a construction worker in Oklahoma is 53 years old. Right? Whoa. And going back to uh, the more modern apprenticeships, cybersecurity is really mm -hmm. big. Yeah. Coding is really big. Um, advanced manufacturing, being able to fix the robots that break down on manufacturing lines. Those are jobs that are going to be in high demand for a long time, especially right. as automation continues to increase. And I'm also thinking forward 10 to 15 years when you have autonomous vehicles, um, particularly sure. autonomous semi-trucks uh, in parts of the country. Budweiser's already delivering their beer autonomously wow. through semi-trucks. So these are things that I have been looking at. How is this going to affect the economy? And then when, in fact, uh, automation does displace jobs, how can we help those people get reskilled and back into the workforce? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a uh, 
big concern. Like there's a huge change management component to even people that have technology jobs are often worried about even within the federal government of like they're going to lose their jobs or whatever. Yep. But and going back to your question, how I ended up in Oklahoma City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So after I was working on that rig for a little bit, I decided to utilize my undergraduate degree, which was in English, mm -hmm. to become a teacher. And I was doing my student teaching at Norman. And one particular day, we had a substitute in the classroom, and I noticed that they had been on the computer a long time, so I kind of went back there to say, what's up, what's going on, you know? Yeah. And I, he said, look how many openings there are in Oklahoma City for, jo for teaching, right? And I was sc scrolling through a little bit, and I saw an opening at U.S. Grant High School, and okay. I was like, hey, this is right up my alley. So I created an account with OKCPS. I sent my resume and my transcripts and everything that they needed to... Uh, uh, possibly hire me the next day. I mm -hmm. had a job interview, and Whoa. then I was hired. And so for the first few months, I uh, commuted back and forth from Norman to South Oklahoma City and ended, ended up liking the job so much in the area that I bought a house just right down the road. Wow. First home, um, had a mortgage, enjoying life, and then uh, about six months later, the education budget cuts came through. Yeah. And I was one of 19 let go at Grant, and I believe there were over 800 teachers So like a first in, across. first out thing? Yeah. It was, I'd only been teaching for two years. Yeah. And um, yeah. so I got the hatch. But... I had luckily saved up enough money to be able to get me through. And then this is when I first decided that maybe I could run for office and do something from inside the Capitol instead of advocating from outside. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at my money and my finances and I realized that I had just enough to get me through to November 8th. And so from there, I just took that message, that story to the doors and listened more than anything and got to know my neighbors all across District 93. And mm -hmm. eventually it worked out. That's 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 awesome, man. That's um, and I, I I feel like that sort of jives with, you know, your journey and just like, uh, I mean, being open to stuff <laughs> as it happens. Like, well, this happened. One door closes, another well, that's door opens. Exactly right. Like, a lot of times, like for example, the NFL didn't work out. Yeah. But because I kept my eyes open, and um, kept my head up. I was able to see another opportunity. And usually when I speak to younger kids, I go into a bit more depth than that and how, how to recognize opportunities, how to maybe create your own, especially when it seems like the cards are stacked against you. Yeah. And, and in the neighborhoods I live in and I visit, that seems to be the case a lot. And so that's always been a part of my legislation too. And that's one uh, avenue where Apprenticeship Oklahoma came through was creating more opportunities, helping kids create their own opportunities yeah. And many of them don't even know they're out there. Can I throw something out there? And, uh, I mean, that seems like um, I agree with everything that you just said. One of the things that I would, I would associate that, uh, that mindset, that whole, the whole idea of opportunities and that sort of thing, I would often associate that with someone like a more, that's the lingo of someone who's probably more conservative in a way. Mm. I don't know. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but the, there's there's a there's a lot a lot of lines about you know making things happen for yourself, right. and, I, and I'm not saying the Democrats don't right. believe How that. How are you going to pull anything. yourself up by the bootstrap right. if you don't have any boots? Yeah, bootstraps. Yeah. <laughs> well, generational poverty is very very real, and unfortunately, yeah. a lot of these children are lacking role models um, from people who have been there before. And yeah. Being able to talk to someone who has. Uh, been there before and I and I definitely understand that I've had a lot of advantages in my life and um, I'm not denying that but I think it's important for kids to have important role models in their lives and I'm involved with PALS which is the Police Athletic League and I've okay. seen what Peter Evans has done with that and that's a great example of getting kids um, working with or coached by positive role models within the community. A lot of police officers volunteer with that, community leaders and so it's through that those type of programs and that type of interaction that will help kids and even know that the possibility is out there. A lot of times you ask kids on the south side, like, how far have you traveled outside yeah. of Oklahoma City? And I guarantee you some of them say more Oklahoma, right? Oh, man. And so a lot of these deals are just a matter of kids needing to know that there are options out there and we're going to help you create that. We're going to help you create that. Awesome, man. Uh, you seem to be pretty um, uh, adept or uh, with social media and just like 
you, you know, your your Facebook game is strong. And I don't know about Twitter because I'm not great at Twitter. Twitter, not so much. I'm not great at I, any of those. I, I've utilized Twitter more often now, but... But you've yeah. got some drone videos and you've mm-hmm. got yourself walking around and stuff. Um, and I know that you wrote you wrote a book about uh, getting yourself recruited mm-hmm. and, and doing the things to land a scholarship. And this is kind of jumping around a bit, but social media is such a big part of recruitment these days that it's like I have no idea, which is what makes Lincoln Riley at OU so special because he's pretty good at it. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Um, I don't know if there's a question associated with that. It's just more of an admiration thing. Well, thanks. But I I do think that being able to market your ideas or even as an athlete yourself is very important. And in my book, Recruit Yourself, it's not just – it's not easy. I promise you that. Right. It is one of – and especially nowadays, I mean, it is probably one of the most difficult things to become uh, recognized by college coaches. In my case, in Bartlesville, our team was absolutely horrible. We won three games my junior year, one game my senior year. Oh, wow. My head coach was fired immediately after my last game as a senior, and my, co- my parents had no idea what to do. A lot of guys on our team wanted to play college football, and I, talent-wise, they could have, yeah. but it just seemed like such an uphill battle. And so first thing I did, because the coach's office wasn't even locked, I went in there and grabbed every VHS tape. I'm dating yeah. myself uh, from when I was a sophomore and until I was a senior. And like I said, although that our team lacked overall success as an individual, I did pretty well. Mm-hmm. I, each year I had at least nine to ten sacks and, it's pretty good. and you know, good tackles and whatnot. So anyway, I went through every single game that I'd ever played and on a uh, legal pad wrote down the time on the VCR Yeah, and I uh, called up a, wit- a wedding videographer and I gave him the times and, and he and I sat down for oh like a solid 24 hours and then wow. just threw just these edited. plays on a on a master DVD and then I went home and I copied the DVD onto VHS tapes I made about 100 of them and then I sent them out to oh probably about 70 D1 schools and the rest were D2 schools and then I started to call, cold calling coaches and saying, hey, you know, the information that you requested is on its way. It should arrive in a day or two. And they had no idea who I was. Yeah, I, like and I don't that, know though. if this helped or not, but whenever the package arrived, it may have sparked their interest because after about a month, I started getting some uh, feedback. And I found out that if I could get the attention of Division II schools, mm-hmm. and if they were to offer me, then that would validate me as an athlete, and right. I could get more attention from the D1 schools. So that actually worked with Missouri State. They're a Division yeah. I AA school, and they invited me down, and they offered me a, a full ride. And then right after that, immediately, uh, Louisiana Monroe, Colorado State, and SMU came through. Nice. And so I ended up going on a few official visits, and then I decided on SMU. And, and it took off from there. But I'll tell you what, in, in recruiting, just like in politics, it's a lot about timing. And it, it is about timing and who sees you and, and what happens. Like, don't forget, I was running against an incumbent, Mike yeah. Christian. And it's always going to be an uphill battle because one of the things you need to get your message out is money. Mm-hmm. And if they've got the uh, support of firefighters and whatnot, then, like, you know, Mike's a good vote for us, Mickey. And as long as he's there, our loyalty is with him. I was like, I respect that. But uh, if you beat him, then we'll help you out, too, if you're good, if you're good vote for us, right, to help firefighters. And so I was going door to door, and eventually Mike decided to run for sheriff, and it became an open seat. Well, guess who came through? Yeah. Firefighters and AFL, and it was a good deal. And so that was all about timing. You know, that was about Mike Christian, the incumbent, deciding to run for sheriff. And then I had already talked to a lot of my neighbors and kind of had a leg up. I drew a primary opponent and then uh, won that and then went on to uh, November. That's awesome, man. That's uh, it, it makes me think of that. I can't remember the full saying where it's like, luck is just uh, where preparation meets opportunity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. I we used to have that in our locker room. <laughs> yeah. Hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Yeah. And I saw someone credited KD with that, but I'm like, no. I, I was in my locker room way before KD was ever on the scene. Yeah, before KD was even in Texas. <laughs> he may have said it, though. Well, yeah, he doesn't get it. He doesn't. Uh question about um, I was going to ask about tree trunks mm, but yeah. I didn't write it down oh yeah tree trunks what's tree trunks <laughs> are you still are you still involved in tree trunks yeah yeah actually I just sold a pair today 
They are neoprene knee sleeves okay. that are very popular amongst CrossFitters, strongmen, Highlander games, the guys who wear kilts yeah, yeah, and yeah. throw telephone poles. I've looked into that a little bit. Even hikers like them. But I came up with tree trunks when we were in Calgary, Canada. We were pushing in the America's Cup tour. And I asked my coach if we had any knee sleeves. Because keep in mind, like this is these are places that are so cold. One night I was out warming up with a, oh. a rubber jump rope, and my jump rope just shattered. It oh was so gosh. cold. The rubber just shattered. And so you can imagine what your knees feel like. Well, he gave me some McDav- McDavid knee sleeves. Right. I'm like, these are weak. And so I came back home, and I started messing around with some neoprene. And I created a prototype. And I actually was on this cross-country road trip, and I came across this gym in Nashville. And one of the gym owners was uh, starting his own knee sleeve company, and I kind of got with him. I showed him my prototype. He helped me get, make the connections with the manufacturer, and we started making them. Wow. So I launched that, and I decided to have a little Planet Profit business model in it. So every time someone buys a pair of knee sleeves, I plant a tree through the American Forest Federation. Okay. And uh, people just like to give back. So you've got some really cool like hashtags like family roots or um oh, strong roots or branch out dig deep you know there are a lot of the yeah. uh, a lot of different cool sayings to market but uh, more importantly they just provide people the compression and warmth that they need on their knees on their tendons so they're not as sore the next day they can continue doing what they like right totally i find that uh anytime i do deadlifts or or like Cleans front squats, squats yeah, yeah i need them Especially yeah, with my old knees. Right, and it's, a lot of people don't know that your tendons take quite a bit longer to warm up than your muscles. And so the neoprene, especially this being 7 millimeters, it provides a level of warmth that really gets them warmed up. And so you'll find that you're more flexible, you're not a sore the next day, and they're just a good deal overall, especially for preventive measures. Cool. A lot of Olympic weightlifters like to wear them. So it sounds like then, I'm going to tie this together, check this out. So, uh, uh, so if I were a business, if I had perhaps a neoprene manufacturing business, as a business owner, how how can I get involved in apprenticeship? Okay, and what's in it for me as a business owner? Uh, that's a really good question. So, if you're a manufacturer and you need a highly skilled workforce and you would contact the state and we would get you registered in the apprenticeship oklahoma program we would find out what your needs are and then we would either collaborate with the community colleges or the career techs to create the curriculum that you would need to where we could give kids in high school the opportunity to take those classes to work at your company while getting paid and then graduate with a professional certificate and a high school diploma and no educational debt so it's a win-win-win all around. Now, the kid can continue to work for you, mm-hmm. or they can continue to work for you and go to a traditional four-year college. It's not saying that you're set in a particular career or trade for the rest of your life. It's just creating more options okay. uh, that will get, get you off your feet. Because right now, I'll tell you, a lot of kids have no idea what they want to do. And so, like, the um, grown-up answer is go to college, you'll figure it out. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, about $30,000 later, they may not still know what they want to do. They're in their early 30s, and they're still figuring that out. And that's very, very common. So the most important thing is to learn something, a trade, a skill that will carry you through and you can pursue other passions and interests later in life, but you'll always have something to fall back on and make a pretty good living at. I have a saying called high fives without the four, which is high five figure salaries without the traditional four year degree. Yeah. And if you want to go into the traditional four year degree, that's great. But it's not like that is your only option right out of high school. Just like, you know, going to the military or the armed services is a really good deal too. You learn a trade, you usually learn a really highly valuable skill and then you have the your GI Bill and you can use to go to school and you get back and so there's no notion there's a stigma around that every kid right out of co- right, right out of high school must go to college in order to be a success yeah. and have a good paying job and that's just simply not true that's probably one of the biggest obstacles that we have right now though is getting over that stigma especially when it comes to the parents awesome man so uh, is there a, is there a vote on that or what what needs to happen with that Should people just set Google alerts and find out what's going on <laughs> Well, um, it won't. There won't be a vote on it. Uh, I mean, potentially next session. This is uh, going to be in conjunction with Oklahoma Works, and okay. so 
one of the, like I said, one of the stigmas we have is that um, kids just aren't aware of this opportunity. And so we want to get this into the counselor's offices, maybe have a campaign to where we have posters to get the literature to help the kids know that there's something different. And then to also look at what are the regulations on, for example, if you have a manufacturing plant and a Mm -hmm. 16-year-old wants to work with you, there are some rules right now that say, you know, you can only hire 18. So we may drop those down to as long as they're going through a uh, registered apprenticeship through career tech, then they can have the option to get that hands-on training, which is they're finding out for, and then they've known it for some time. It's very vital for helping the learning process. It's yeah. Not just learning the textbook, but to have hands-on training. And I can attest to that right now because I'm at, I'm in the OU's Masters of Public Administration program. Mm-hmm. And the things that we learn from the textbook in theory are so much different from what really happens in practice right here in the Capitol. Yeah. And so, I mean, with, if you're just learning all your information from a textbook, that's really doing the student a disservice with the, the amount of money that they're spending. There should absolutely, in every degree, in every major, be some type of applicable hands-on training. Yeah. Cool, man. All right. Final five questions. Final five. Sometimes they're rapid fire. Uh, what's your morning routine like? Uh, morning routine. I've got to. I've got to have a shower in the morning. That's that's what wakes me up. I like to go work out. Uh, I'll do some type of CrossFit, weightlifting. Okay. That kind of wakes me up. Cool. Biggest musical influence. Uh, that's a really big. One. That's a good one. Uh, my biggest musical musical influence is Nirvana. That was my youngest bro- uh, Well, my only brother uh, who passed away. That was his uh, favorite band, and it's getting gotten me through a lot of really hard times. And uh, it just really, really speaks to me. Right on. Favorite non-scriptural book. Favorite what non-scriptural? Like non-scriptural. I, I try to since I've talked to religious people, uh, I I don't want them to say the Bible or the Quran or any scripture. Recruit yourself how to earn an NCAA football. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I read a lot of different books right now. I'm reading mo- mostly, um, mostly just textbooks. And so yeah. uh, whatever, like right now for school, it's just been, my mind has just been boggled down with so many textbooks. Oh, man. Bowling Alone, I would say, is probably my favorite one right now that I'm reading. It's a commentary on why the communities in America have broken up since, like, for example, the 1950s and 1960s when people used to belong to uh, chess clubs and bowling, bowling clubs. Leagues, and they were yeah. the community was much more together but what they found out is that people have been worked to the bone for long hours and, and low wages and that that ability to have that community involvement that civic engagement is dissipating and especially the amount of time that people have to commute to their job now yeah. is affecting the person's impact or ability to com- uh, participate in the community all right that's a good one man that would really appeal to me because i've read some articles about like how grown men are lonelier than they've ever been or something like that and uh and it kind of makes that case why and so that would be good have you seen the movie her yeah very interesting right Mm -hmm. he falls in love with an artificial intelligence girlfriend and um i find that very interesting i don't know that i'm not totally against that (laughs) because uh, (laughs) um We always talk about self-help, and at the end of the movie, I won't spoil it for anyone, but he, he discovers himself uh, as kind of um, the futuristic self-help version of yeah. what we have now, huh? Yeah. Uh, all right. This would be good since you're from Bartlesville. You've been all over. You now live on the uh, south side. Uh, what's your favorite spot in Oklahoma? And you don't have to... Here, I'll make it easier. What's your favorite non-District 93 spot? <laughs> I was going to say, I, I love just chilling in my backyard. It's been so hot this summer, man. I have this inflatable pool oh, that I just fill best. up, and I've got my floating Wi-Fi speaker, and I just kick it in there. But um, when I'm not doing that, I like um, I like the Midtown area a yeah. lot, uh, you know, Fassler and, um, and Blue Garden. Mm-hmm. Those are real chill places that are nice to relax with friends and watch the Thunder play. So, yeah, yeah. Midtown. Cool. And what's your evening routine? Oh, my evening routine. I like to watch The Daily Show at night, and then I usually switch on over to Colbert. Yeah. And uh, and then finish up with a little bit of reading. Right on, man. I didn't mean to say man. Representative Dolan, thanks so much. I'm man. All right, man. Have a good one. I appreciate you. Thank you all. Are you watching a movie? No, I'm going to watch Ken Burns. It's not really good. You know Ken Burns is good? 
I don't want to watch Cam Burns. You can't watch Cam Burns. Thank you for listening to the episode. Thanks for stopping by. I really appreciate it. If you like this, please subscribe to the podcast for more episodes with uh, Oklahoma entrepreneurs and business folks and politicians and um, civic and community leaders and just normal people because that's that's kind of what we're getting into now. I just I, I like facilitating the telling of a story and that's really what it's about. I know there's a lot of stuff to listen to out there, so I really appreciate y'all taking the time to listen to this particular show. And until next time, don't be a stranger.